This is really what geroscience is, the therapeutic potential by targeting the hallmarks of aging to have a positive impact on age-related functional declines. The take-home message is there's a huge, huge economic advantage to increasing healthy life expectancy, even by relatively small amounts, that even a one-year increase in healthy life expectancy through a geroscience approach is worth about $38 trillion in productivity. My name is Matt Caberline, and welcome to the OptiSpan YouTube channel. Hey everyone, welcome to the OptiSpan podcast. And on today's episode in our Science of Longevity series, we're going to talk about geroscience, what that word means and why it's important. And I thought maybe a useful place to start is just by a definition. So I think there are a few different ways that people use this word geroscience, but I'm going to use the definition that geroscience is uh, the study of the biological mechanisms connecting biological age with disease and disability. So it's a little bit different from pure biology of aging research because what we're really interested in with geroscience is how does the biology of aging and those mechanisms actually connect up to cause age-related functional declines and diseases. Um, the National Institute on Aging defines geroscience as sort of intersection of basic aging biology, chronic disease, and health. So very similar conceptually to the definition that I just gave. Um, and I think it's useful to appreciate that geroscience is really a pretty new term and new concept. Um, if you just look at publications in the scientific literature and the appearance of the word geroscience, either in the title or the abstract of the papers, what you can see is it really <laughs> was first used in this sort of context in 2008 in a Nature Reviews uh, cancer paper and has sort of increased exponentially in its appearance in uh, titles and abstracts of articles since then. Um, and that seems to be increasing still. So there's really been this sort of exponential increase in visibility of the word, use of the word in the scientific literature. And um, the reason for that, I think, is because this idea of aging biology connecting up with disease, you know, is really fundamentally important for human health. Um, and certainly, if you look at this from the perspective of, you know, what do people die from? What do people get sick with? It's clear that aging biology really is at the root of most of the major causes of death and disability, um, at least in developed nations. And one way to appreciate this is to simply consider, you know, the 10 major killers in the United States. So data from the CDC, you can rank these things. Heart disease is number one, cancer number two. COVID-19 was number three, I think, beginning in 2020 or 2021. Um, accidents is number four. Stroke is number five. Uh, and then the list goes on and on. And I think the thing to appreciate here is that when you look at this top 10 causes of death, nine of them have age, and I would argue biological age, as their greatest risk factor. The only one that age isn't the greatest risk factor for is accidents but everything else really is strongly associated with age. And again, I think a plausible case can be made causally associated with biological age. And so age really is at the root of the greatest killers. And if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, relative uh, effect size of different risk factors, again, age just dwarfs the common risk factors that we would typically think about, like alcohol use, smoking, uh, obesity, things like that. Um, and it, it's by orders of magnitude, right? So for cancer, heart disease, COVID-19, and Alzheimer's disease, the increase in risk from going from age 45 to 85, so four decades of biological or chronological aging, it just dwarfs the risk uh, associated with these other individual risk factors. So again, um, not only is age the greatest risk factor for the most important causes of death and disability, but it is by far the greatest risk factor. Um, and so this leads to, you know, what I would suggest is the fuel for where we need to get to for healthcare in the United States and other places around the world, what I would call 21st century medicine. Really, geroscience should fuel this transition towards proactive preventative healthcare. 
Um, because age is the greatest risk factor for most of the major causes of death and disability, if we can understand that biological aging process, it really gives us the opportunity to therapeutically target biological aging in order to slow the onset and progression of most, maybe all, of the functional declines and diseases that go along with aging. And so this is really the promise of geroscience. And I think the good news is that we've made a lot of progress in understanding aging. So I think it's fair to say that we are starting to solve the biological aging process. And there are many ways to appreciate this. I think one sort of easy way to think about this is through the framework of the hallmarks of aging. And we'll get into the hallmarks of aging in the next episode in this series. But for now, just appreciate that the hallmarks of aging really represent what scientists have discovered as the key features of biological aging. And there are 12 hallmarks of aging. Um, they include things like genomic instability and telomere shortening and epigenetic changes and mitochondrial dysfunction. And these really are what have emerged from the scientific research of biological aging to be shared about the biological aging process across the animal kingdom. And I think, again, a pretty plausible case can be made that these are causal in many of the functional declines and diseases that go along with aging. So hallmarks of aging certainly are not a comprehensive representation of biological aging, but they represent, I think, a pretty good picture of what our understanding of biological aging is now. And the important thing to appreciate is as we start to understand what biological aging is, this gives us opportunities to actually target those mechanisms to have an impact on biological aging, optimally to slow it down, or maybe even in some cases to reverse the damage that has accumulated as a cause of biological aging. And so again, this is really what geroscience is, is this interaction between the hallmarks of aging and age-related functional declines and diseases and the therapeutic potential by targeting the hallmarks of aging to have a positive impact on age-related functional declines and diseases. So that's the good news. The bad news is that geroscience is still, I would argue, massively underfunded and understudied, certainly compared to other areas of biomedical research. And one way to appreciate this is to look at the funding picture for the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest federal funder of biomedical research in the United States. The National Institutes of Health is broken up into several individual institutes, which in many cases are focused around individual areas of study and by and large individual diseases. And so looking at this pie of the NIH funding allocations, NCI, which is the National Cancer Institute, gets the biggest chunk of the pie at $7.3 billion. The second biggest piece of the pie goes to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at $6.6 .6 billion. This, is, I believe, is 2023 numbers. That kind of makes sense. We just came out of the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of resources went into infectious disease. Um, the third biggest piece of the pie is the NIA, the National Institute on Aging. And then from there, it goes to heart, lung, and blood, general medicine, neurodegenerative disease and stroke. And then there are a whole bunch of other institutes that get smaller pieces of the pie. So you might look at this and say, well, okay, age is the greatest risk factor for cancer and heart disease and certainly death due to infectious diseases, at least in the elderly. So, you know, third, third largest piece of the pie isn't too bad. Unfortunately, the majority of the National Institute on Aging funding doesn't actually go to the study of aging. Uh, so if we break up NIA funding, the bulk of NIA funding goes to study Alzheimer's disease, which is only one of many diseases of aging. The resources that actually go to the biology of aging, to geroscience, is about $0.3 billion, so less than 10% of the National Institute on Aging budget. Many people suggest that the A in aging should stand for Alzheimer's disease. Some people suggest it should stand for something else. But clearly, the majority of resources at NIA are not going to study aging. And if you look at the biology of aging in the context of the whole NIH budget, it is about 0.6%. So six-tenths of 1% of NIH research funding is allocated to the greatest risk factor for nine out of 10 of the major killers in the United States, which to me seems absurd. But that's the reality of the situation. 
Now, I think we could make many arguments for why that is out of whack. Uh, one would be to ask the question, since cancer and heart disease you know, are the two leading causes of death and where much of the NIH budget is allocated, what would the impact be if we could cure those things on life expectancy and health span in the United States? And so um, this is uh, data that was generated by a demographer named J.L. Shansky originally. And this is actually a very smart approach. What Jay did was to look at the data from the CDC. CDC keeps track of what people die from in the United States and ask, what would the effect be for a typical 50-year-old woman if we just took out all the deaths due to cancer? What impact would that have on life expectancy across the population for a typical 50-year-old woman? And the answer is it's about three years of added life expectancy. If we had a magic pill today that could cure all forms of cancer. You can ask the same question about heart disease. If we took out all the deaths due to heart disease, what would the impact be on life expectancy for a typical 50-year-old woman? It's a little bit more, but still right around three years of added life expectancy. Even if we could cure both, right? So now we've got two magic pills. We cure both cancer and heart disease. That'll get you a little bit better. It gets you up to about seven years of added life expectancy. So when I first saw this data, I was kind of shocked. I really expected the impact at the population level from curing cancer to be much bigger than three years. And again, I don't want to minimize the impact of curing an individual's cancer. Obviously, if you or your spouse or your mom or your dad or anybody you love has cancer, you want that cancer cured. I get it. Yes, absolutely. At the individual level, curing disease is really, really important. I'm not at all suggesting we shouldn't do that. At the population level, though, the impact is much smaller, I think, than most people appreciate. And so you can ask the question then, how does this compare to the impact of slowing aging? And obviously, we don't know yet whether we can do this in people. But if we compare it to what is pretty routine in laboratory animals in terms of impact on life expectancy, lifespan, the impact on life expectancy for this typical 50-year-old woman is much greater than curing individual diseases. And probably more importantly, the bulk of those years are predicted to be spent in relatively good health because we haven't cured only one disease. We haven't impacted only one disease. We've pushed back the functional declines and diseases of aging on whole. And so this is the idea of increasing both health span and lifespan. Curing individual diseases really is not expected to have a large effect on health span. If anything, it might diminish health span if we don't cure the diseases, but we just keep people alive suffering from chronic disease. But by targeting aging, we can have a proportional at least impact on health span and lifespan. And I think the experimental data are at least consistent with the idea that when we do this in laboratory animals, we actually have a disproportionate effect on health span, where health span is actually extended more than lifespan is extended. So again, I think the approach of targeting aging is obviously far more effective and far more efficient than trying to cure individual diseases in isolation. Again, requires to be proven that we can do this in people, but I would argue we should be spending a lot more resources on attempting to accomplish targeting aging as opposed to attempting to cure individual diseases. An economic argument, so that's life expectancy, an economic argument can also be made for the geroscience approach. And again, this was work that was originally done by J.L. Shansky, a real leader in this area, uh, and, and Dana Goldman, and then more recently, a new analysis by Andrew Scott and David Sinclair and other people have done economic analyses as well. And the numbers maybe aren't so important. I think we can argue about the numbers, but the take home message is there's a huge, huge economic advantage to increasing healthy life expectancy, even by relatively small amounts. So uh, Andrew Scott's analysis suggests that even a one year increase in healthy life expectancy through a geroscience approach is worth about 38 trillion dollars in productivity. And just for comparison, the current US debt is 34 trillion. So we're talking potentially extremely large impacts on economic productivity that don't stop at one year, right? I mean, if these interventions are brought to market and made widely available, these 
gains in economic productivity will be year over year greater and greater. So again, I think the economic argument is kind of obvious. I think the quality of life argument is kind of obvious. I think the question is why then is it still the case that this transition to appropriate recognition and support for geroscience has been so slow? And I mean, I think there's many factors that that come into play here. I think there is a historical perception that maybe some of the research in this field has been lower quality. Uh, I can't completely disagree with that. I think 30, 40 years ago, um, it is the case that many of the studies in the biology of aging were not up to the standards of, of some other areas of scientific research, although there are plenty of low quality studies in every area of scientific research, but that's not the case anymore. That has changed. Um, I think really what it's more about is that I think we're fighting against an entrenched culture and a system that has grown up around keeping people sick, right? Waiting until people are sick and then trying to cure their disease or more often treat their symptoms. And this is true at every level, right? Basic biomedical research. I talked about NIH funding, right? The structure of NIH is built around individual diseases in isolation. It's true in biotech because biotech springs right out of basic biomedical research. It's true in big pharma. Big pharma develop drugs to try to treat disease. And I would argue even within the FDA framework as it exists today, by and large, big pharma develop drugs with incremental effect sizes to target disease. And that's probably a whole nother conversation. So pharmaceutical development, drug approval at FDA is really all built around disease endpoints. And if you look at healthcare, physician training, clinical care, nurse training, again, is all built within this culture of reactive disease care. And payers, insurers, right, are going to insure for disease treatments. So again, you know, I think that this is a culture that is very challenging to disrupt. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And so I would argue there is a need for more funding for new regulatory pathways, for incentives to develop drugs that target the biology of aging, for new training for physicians and other healthcare workers, and for changes to the healthcare system and the insurance model, all of which would promote not just geroscience, although I think geroscience is a big part of it, but a proactive healthcare system rather than a reactive disease care system. And again, I think this really needs to happen at every level from basic research all the way through to um, healthcare in the clinic. The good news is I kind of feel like things are starting to change. It's not happening as quickly as I would like or probably as any of us would like, but I do think things are starting to change. I think that, you know, people like Peter Atia, who published a very good book on this idea of what he calls medicine 3.0, what I call 21st century medicine. Um, good books have been written about the geroscience uh, approach and the biology of aging. That book, Ageless by Andrew Steele, I think is a good one. We've seen new funders come into the field on the nonprofit side. So Hevolution is a nonprofit foundation that has committed to, to funding up to a billion dollars per year in research on the biology of aging. So again, that's about three times what the NIH puts into this area. So if Hevolution meets those goals, that will have a huge impact. We're seeing interesting new approaches like the XPRIZE HealthSpan Prize to try to enhance excitement, enthusiasm, investment in this field. And we've seen some large investments in the for-profit space in this area. So a couple of examples include uh, Calico, which was uh, funded by Google more than 10 years ago now, and Altos, which is this new uh, biotech company funded by Jeff Bezos and a couple of other high net worth individuals that is really focused on epigenetic reprogramming. And they're being a little bit cagey and you know maybe not wanting to, to explicitly say that they are a geroscience company, but they are. So I think that's reason for, for optimism. I'm also optimistic that we're starting to see some political initiatives in the policy space. And I think this is where a lot of impact could be had by changing the way that policymakers view health. Again, instead of really focusing on sickness and disease, focusing on strategies that are more effective at keeping people healthy. 
One of the organizations that I am very enthusiastic about is the Alliance for Longevity Initiatives. I'll actually be going to Washington, D.C. for an event that they're hosting in March. And they have started the Longevity Caucus in the United States House of Representatives. So I think this is important, right? It's a start towards getting policy and political momentum moving towards amplifying geroscience as an important concept and area of research. And I am personally working on contributing to what I would call a geroscience-inspired disruption of medicine. So as many of you know, about a year ago, I left my academic position, took off my biomedical research hat, and put on a hat that is really geared towards trying to be thoughtful about how do we help to usher in, accelerate, enable this transition to proactive preventative healthcare. So that's what OptiSpan is really all about. I think, again, you know, we are one of many organizations in this space who are really trying to develop new ways to help healthcare providers practice this kind of medicine and to facilitate a transition from 20th century medicine to 21st century medicine. We'll talk a lot more about what OptiSpan is all about and how we're approaching this in future episodes on the podcast. So again, I just want to leave you with kind of the big picture here, which is that geroscience really is 21st century medicine. That as we start to better understand the biological mechanisms of aging, that will give us more and more opportunities to target those mechanisms in effective ways to delay the onset and progression of multiple age-related functional declines and diseases. And I believe that this is really at the core of increasing health span, improving quality of life for as many people as possible. So I hope you found this content informative. I hope you learned something new. As always, if you have any comments or questions, please post them below. And I hope you're enjoying the content on the OptiSpan YouTube channel. Please hit subscribe and we'll see you next time.